Okay, this is kind of the time of the year where I, I've been waiting for all year. Um, the garden is beginning to pop with the colors and the bushes. I spent the day gardening today, so it's nice to see the reap the rewards as it were. Um, but, um, but there's more spectacular things coming soon. But uh, all the bushes have got leaves, so the flowers will be the next things to come out. They're all flowering bushes, basically. But um, there you go. This is how pretty Lahave is. My neighbor built their property and painted it orange, so I've been trying to plant bushes that work well with orange. And flowers with blue and purple. But anyway, gardening day today. This is my uh, setup I just made. Uh, I'm still trying to figure out how to demonstrate uh, during COVID times, so I'm not getting um, people breathing down my neck as it were. <laughs> but, um, but this is right by my door where I do my recycling and people can look through a screen door uh, right at where I'm throwing. Um, so that, I hope, gives me a little bit of safety as far as people breathing virus right at me. Uh, I've had COVID and I don't want it again. So, uh, but um, it was uh, uh, just, you know, trying to demonstrate is, you know, it's part of the process here that I really set this studio up to do and have people, you know, right around me, but, um, but it hasn't been possible during COVID. So I made a, sto a tall stool. I made a stand for my wheel uh, with a little foot pedal shelf on the stand. Um, and I tried standing up and throwing, but I'm not, comfortable doing that. I feel like standing on my left leg while I've got my foot on the foot pedal is just uh, not for me. My mother did that as a, her job as a welder for 40 odd years and she had to have knee operations on both knees because she wore them out just standing on one leg. She had a foot pedal where she spot welded um, but um, I don't want to do that. So here we go. I'm going to try this out today. Good morning, this is Vaughan at uh, westcoatbellpottery.ca in Nova Scotia. Um, so I'm gonna throw a bunch of balls today uh, just to get myself in the mood again. Um, I have a whole slew of things in the cupboard waiting to be fired, um, but, um, but I've been concentrating on the carving. So um, and I hope you watched that video and you enjoyed it. But uh, so I'm gonna set you up and cheers. I'm having my cup of tea in my 30 year old coffee mug. <laughs> but. I think you've got a good view there, so that should see on the thing. Put my hands on, we'll try it anyway. Okay, these balls of clay are, uh, I've got 36 balls of clay from a uh, 22 pound block of clay. Um, so they're about one and a, no, they're about half a pound I guess something like that anyway um, and this is a Pacifica wheel Let's see if it'll get going actually Put the wheel the only problem I have uh, I don't throw on this wheel very very long I bought it four, five six seven years ago um, and um, the electrics on it went twice um, and I sent it back the first time I had to pay shipping to get this wheel back to get it repaired um, and then I got it back and I threw on it for, I don't know, a month or something and it went all over again. So I'm not happy with the electrics on this wheel. So I had it direct wired. So, um, uh, basically I've got this wired right into a switch on the actual thing. So I never have to turn it on and off because it was the on and off switch that kept breaking. Um, so it's a nice wheel to throw on, but I, I think that the on off switch, um, maybe the, you know, just not or you know strong strong enough for using a lot but um so if pacific is listening i think you need to do something with your on off switch but i like your wheel it's just basically um i have to direct wire it in so i only turn it on and off on the wall all right so block of clay now this is my first time throwing these little balls on here I, I threw some bigger pieces on here when I first set it up. Yeah, it's not too bad. I had to put a little cushion on the stool so that um, it's a little easier to sit on. The first time I sat on this, it was actually a little bit um, top on the bum. 
So I'm just going to throw one of these, show you what I'm going to throw, and then I'm going to go through how I do it. Half a pound of clay, remember, and this is number 516 from Pottery Supply House. I think I might be booming their business because it's been hard for me to get my order of clay this summer. I ordered it like six, eight weeks ago and it still isn't here because they're, they're doing really well. So I think maybe a lot of people are buying this clay now. This is my last bolt and my last box of it. And they said they won't ship till June, so I won't have any of this clay left after today. And this is the 25th of May, so hopefully it'll come early June. I call these my rice bowls. So I bought some bowls years ago. Um, they were blue and white, traditional Japanese little rice bowls, and I really liked them. They're not very good for stabbing carrots in, as my customers have said. But basically it's a nice trumpet shape rice bowl. I should hopefully if I remembered I put some flower pictures in the beginning of this video because it is really spring now the bushes are starting to flower out I did a lot of photographs of those last year but I'll do some more pictures this year the bushes are bigger this year so that's my metal rib so I do that on the outside and then I come back and put it on the inside and I can drag the water off the surface. This clay is so beautiful, it's really smooth, it's not quite like porcelain, but it's really smooth. And just drag up there, and then just knock off the water on the rim. If I want to, I can just take that rim and open it a bit more and make more of a trumpet shape. You can also curl it in and make it into a more rounded shape. I have a rack that I make to put these balls on, that I've made to put the balls on. And I put a little spiral right in the center there. And these have such a small base on them that they're easy to take off the wheel. I just put a little groove so that I can throw some water underneath there and then you can keep the wheel spinning or you can actually stop it and just pull through and I like to kind of just turn it slowly and it comes loose and then you just use your fingertips and push off and there's the little spiral on the inside and you've got a good profile flared out quite a long way That was bigger than I thought I was going to be making these, so maybe I've got quite a bit too much clay, but it's fine. There we go. So, a little block of clay. What do I do? you got to dry that piece of clay. I always leave that piece of clay on there because it helps the next one stick to it. Um, and then because it's a square, not an actual round, because I don't spend a long time banging them into balls, you can bang it down right on the corner and then just do that to round it off a little bit and you're away so you've got to make sure though that that wasn't wet the, the wheel head was dryish, uh, so there's no surface water left that little sticky bit of clay is all and this bangs on top and you make sure there's no water from your hand getting underneath the piece as you bang it down and just give it a couple of bangs like that and that actually makes sure it's stuck now I don't have a wall next to this wheel like I do in my other wheels, so centering, you've got to put both, my thighs are really just the right height, I set this up just right so that my thighs are higher than the splash pan. Uh, the splash pan is great to lean on, but over the years, I've had um, a little test on my arms because I had carpal tunnel, and they said I have nerve damage in the bottom part of my arms where I lean on the splash pan. Uh, so, um, so be aware of that, cushion it, and make sure it's cushion it or lean on your thighs rather than on the thin splash pan. Um, after you've done it for a long time, you'll be very appreciative of knowing that ahead of time. 
I had surgery on my hands about 15 years ago, and it's ne the carpal tunnel's never come back. I just have to be a little careful when I do those carving pieces with the murals. And there you go. So, you're centering it. What did I do? Got an off-center ball of clay. Put this hand down on the wheat, on the splash pan. See how it, it cleaned that out there? Because it's basically wiping, it's right on there. And it'll burn if you don't have it lubricated. Uh, so this hand is anchored to my elbow on my thigh and then the splash pad, the actual wheel head, it's gliding on it. So it's pretty strong. You can't really push this hand away very easily. And then this hand comes on top and I position it so I can see half the clay basically going through my hands. So I can actually feel and see what's going on. And then I apply both pressure equally down with this hand, right on the, on the wheel head. And this hand is folded with my thumbs like that so that I can keep my hands kind of formed together. And I lean on my thighs with both elbows and then anchor myself so that I can, my head is right over the top of the ball of clay too. And then I put all the pressure I can on it, but top hand goes just a fraction of a second first so you don't slide the piece right off the wheel. So watch how I do it. Wet the whole thing and then push. And as soon as you feel it stop wobbling, you let go slowly, and that's very important, so that you don't let go and it starts wobbling again. If you let go too fast, it'll start wobbling again. And you should end up with a hockey puck. All right, put some water over the top. Now I put my middle finger, it's a small piece, so I don't need to do two fingers like that. My middle finger down into the center and feel for that center and then push towards the center. My fingertip is right on the center and push down, keep it wet. Always let go slowly and then open it up just a little bit, just to have your little ball shape started and then wet your, this hand as well because this one hand was getting dry. And then I always put a compress with my fingertip right towards the center a couple of times to compress that center. We just stretch the clay now and compressing it again. And then I Decide how big a ball I want, so I open up. If I wanted a tall ball, I wouldn't open up wide very much. I would open it up and then pull straight away. But this one, I want it to be wide. So once again, I'm just compressing a couple of times from the wall to the center. And you can feel a little bubble of clay come to the center point, and then you push it back in, and that's the compression. Okay, now we're gonna change hands over to this side. I'm resting these two fingers on the wheel head itself to do the start of the pull. And then these fingers, but my thumbs are touching and the fingertips are right opposite each other, angled at 45 degrees. So the clay runs through the, this finger first, flows over that finger, then flows onto that finger and push, that's the motion of pushing the clay up. But the first thing you've got to do is make sure it's wet. And then you do the rest right on the wheel head, remember, with the right hand, and then you pull up and the clay flows. And then it started to dry out. So you've got to let go slowly if it starts to dry out wet down inside and outside push in deep with your outside fingers and start a pull straight away because you try to get on the clay and raise your fingers fast enough so you're always on the sweet wet spot and when you get to the rim you let go slowly and just compress the rim a touch with your other finger there to keep that compression on the rim keep the rim a little fatter you don't want to have balls that have a really thin rim you, you might I mean okay you, you can have a ball with a really thin rim but it'll break quite easily so anyway, same again, deep push with the right hand under the foot and then start the pull because you felt that little lump of clay above your fingers and then you come up and you keep pulling right to the top trying to go evenly so that basically it was wet, always wet just where you're pressing so that you, you go up one circumference of the piece, you're up higher each time. And now, I'm going to put my little foot mark in here. This is a very small base on this one. I wet it, so I'm putting some water on the inside. And I'm going to scrape with the rib. So I press the rib to the, touch the clay, and my fingers on the inside press out right opposite the rib. All the way up. So I dried the clay up. With all the clay coming off. And that kind of dries it a bit so that the clay doesn't get too soft. And then take the water out from the center and pull it all the way up so you've just lubricated the entire inside of the piece. So it's equally smooth all the way up. And then I'm putting the rib back 
and I'm just going to press one more time to widen this time. The, it, the thinness of the rib on the outside is allowing the clay to go through without dragging. And then the last thing is you need to get the water off the inside. You can do that just with the sponge. There's not much in there because I dragged it out once already. But anyway, you can do that with this tool too. And then just lightly, knowing it's dry on the outside, I just lightly touch with the outside finger just to kind of put a bit of pressure on the rib so I can pull the moisture off. There are people in my gallery. Pull the water up, then touch the rim. You can use a leather to do that. This clay is so smooth, there's no grit coming onto the surface anyway. It's like butter. And then put a little spiral in. And you've got it. That's the piece. And then I'm just gonna throw some water underneath. Use the wire to go through and then push straight away and it comes off. Put my fingers underneath the bowl so it doesn't disturb or distort and you've got a nice flared out bowl, less of a trumpet shape on this one. But, um, and there you've got the little spiral on the inside. And these are half a pound balls, as you can see. Do one more for you, and then I'm just going to put you on time motion. Stop time, stop motion, whatever it's called. I dragged all the water off the wheel head, point there, point down, bang, and then just squish it a couple of times, bang down, and it's now sort of rounded. And then you do the whole left hand on the wheel head, right hand, so you can see the clay as it's spinning through my fingers. There's basically a little lump or an air bubble there, so I squished it out. Go up with your left hand, down with your right hand, so you can move the clay around. So if you felt a lump, you should do that a couple of times, just to make sure there's no other lump in there. This is new clay, so it should, have, should be air free. All right, fingertip, find the center and push down just this side of center. So your fingertip is right on the center and then pull out. And you should do that fast enough so you don't have to drag, you know, stop and then get more water. It's nice if you can actually combine a couple of motions and do them fast enough so that it doesn't dry out the clay. When you're first learning to throw it, it will dry out so fast because you're throwing quite slow. And as you get better, you'll be able to cheat a little bit. Anyway, it's nice and wet. Outside fingers push in deep and then start a pull chasing the sweet spot, which is always wet, as long as you haven't been around on that point already. Get water, dribble it right over the rim. Just push in deep with your fingertips on the right hand, and then you start a pull coming outwards, not going high this time, you're pulling wide. Compressing the rim right at the last. Dribble the water right down on the rim edge so it goes inside and outside. This time I won't squash in too much, but I'm going to do a, sec a third pull because I can still feel some thickness at the bottom there. There we go. Dragging the water all the way from the bottom to the top, so it's evenly moist. It's, no, it's not going to drag and slip and drag and slip. It's evenly moist all the way up. Put your oh, I didn't do the foot. I like to get the before I lower it too much. I like to make my little point for the wire to go through first on the outside there, so the wire slips on a bit easier. And then I put my my rib. So the back of the rib's touching the smooth bat because it's made of plastic. It's quite a smooth bat. And then the the rim edge is right on the clay with my fingertip right opposite, dragging the moisture off. As soon as you got the moisture off, you let go slowly, put all that moisture there. 
and then the same the, these fingers make sure no, this is dry on the outside remember so you can't touch hard you've got to lightly just touch opposite the rib so that the rib has something resistance to actually push against and then you let go slowly so you've got the moisture off the inside then you can put yourself a little spiral in You could do anything you want in the inter in the bottom down there. You could even get a stamp and press something. Uh, I've always liked something at the bottom underneath the food when I'm eating. If you see something appear when you're eating, it's like, yeah, there's a, the potter put something there. I remember my mother had a uh, Japanese rice ball that if you held it up to the light, you could see a dragon through the clay. And that always fascinated me when I was a kid. It was hard to see it because it was translucent clay, basically. Anyway, throw your water across the wheel, the rib, the wire, and then just as the wheel spins slowly, just pull through. It doesn't want to release each time, this this clay, so the water may be not, not thick enough with slip, but usually they'll release, and then you slide it onto your fingers. And if you, after you cut through, if you just push off straight away, it, it, it's easy enough just to push it. But um, it's another rice bowl. It's a, and these are still pretty big for half pound bowls. And there we go. We've got three rice bowls. They're all very similar in size, so I'm fairly consistent here. Um, one of them's a bit more trumpet shaped than the other two. But, um, but that's my Japanese rice bowl. Hi, we've got to trim these pieces now. So um, there's a few different ways of trimming. Um, and uh, I use a giffing uh, grip, um, but a lot of people, it's an expensive tool. So uh, I, I think it will speed up your process. So it's worth getting one. Um, but, um, but if you don't have a giffing grip, um, I'm gonna show you how to do it. The way I was taught to do it. There you go, let's get you down on the wheel here. So your wheel has rings on it um so you can see um you know how to center it you just place it in between your rings there and kind of you can judge your distance pretty quickly um and if you don't have rings on your wheel head um you can actually uh let's just get this a little wet first oh do i have any power here oh, let's lift this up a second i like to wet the wheel head just a touch first just to dampen it, put this down, uh, and I'll show you another way in a minute, but um, but then basically I just stick a pit of clay around there. Three, is, three pieces is enough, or you can do four if you're a bit insecure. Um, the danger you have to do, be aware of with these, uh, if you throw like me, which is pretty thin, you can crack your rim quite easily by putting pressure on the, the wall of the rim, so don't just put the pressure down on the wheel head. And then uh, if you're not putting any pressure on the bowl itself, you see I didn't even have to do anything to actually uh, center it. It's pretty close to center straight off the way. And that's just by using the rings that are on the wheel head and a few pieces of clay to hold it. This clay is very dry. I had these wrapped up all night, but um, I had a kiln cooling down in the studio and it actually Slide them a bit past where I would normally want them to be. But basically just center and then trim. This is a Kemper tool that I'd like to trim with and a lot of people use uh, tools that have handles and flat heads like this. That, that works just fine. You can trim with those. This is an old tool. I don't know where I got this. I think I got this in England. You know that, but, um, some of my tools are 45 years old, I think. 
but um, I hate saying that. But anyway, you can just keep trimming with that. And then, this is a trick that will save you some time. I just use my old ribs. This one's a bit narrow to do this here, but, um, but you can trim with these. Just a metal rib, just lightly put pressure on the surface. And that can be trimmed with too. You can see, I don't know, it's spinning so you can't see it that much. But these metal ribs are so sharp, you might want to wrap one end in duct tape if you're a bit worried about it. But I just hold it securely so it doesn't move that much. But you can actually hear it. I'm, on, I'm holding the tool a certain distance from the pot so it's only catching on one side. And then after you've done that for a while, the, look, the sound will start to become more even because the piece is more centered. It's pretty centered anyway. And because these are so dry, I can't do my signature fluting very easily. This usually gets a little deeper than this, but, but I actually just make these little marks down there. And it's like a little fluting decoration on the outside of the piece. Okay, that's, the, that's how I was taught to center. See, I'm so used to doing the giffing grip, I just started to loosen it then. But, um, and then you peel these little lugs of clay back, blow off your dust, and you have a trimmed bowl. Can't really tell, I guess, too much from that, with the lines there, but that's actually, um, that's the basic way of trimming. Um, now, if you are secure about your trimming, and I'm, I don't do it this way, um, but you can wet your wheel head, and then just lightly wet the rim like this. And this. These pieces are pretty dry, so I'm not quite sure if they'll stick very easily or not, but um, it's stuck, there you go, it's stuck. And I should have centered it a little better than that. I was using the rings again, but, and then you trim. I'm just using the metal rib because the clay is very dry. If it was softer, I would use my trimming tool for sure. Now I throw quite thin, so I really don't have to trim much off my pieces at all. And then I choose the little bit that I want to trim with there. Let's see if I can get you to see a little better here. Isn't it nice that you can hear birds outside? That's a starling. The bird flu in Canada is meaning we're not supposed to feed the birds, but I haven't seen a single sick bird this whole winter and spring, so I don't think we have bird flu here yet. Anyway, that's what you do to trim out using this metal rib here. So when you've got these, and after a while they leave a scratch line um, in the surface of the clay when you're throwing, because they get dinged, and so basically, don't throw them out. Use them for trimming. And if you do use them for trimming, they start to get worn out in places, and then you can actually kind of manipulate them so that they become certain shapes. Do I have one of those here? I have some ribs that I've actually deliberately cut out. There you go. I did, by wearing it out, I cut that out so I can trim that shape into my piece. It's just, this one's not the right piece to do it to, but um, um, but you can use those metal ribs because they're very sharp. It's hard to... Oh, watch when you're um, trimming on the wheel head like this because those little nubby things that stick up to hold your bats will hurt your hand if you catch yourself on it. These are just little rice balls, so they've already shrunk quite a bit. But look how dry they are. This is just overnight in a damp cupboard. So the air is very dry here today and yesterday. I, will, I like to trim when they're a lot softer than this. And then to actually get it released, this is the tricky part. You just have to move it over and then get your sponge and just make sure you don't have any debris left on your rim. The reason I don't trim like this is because I've noticed that you can mark your rim a little bit. 
and I throw very thin, so it's it's easy to mark the rim, but sponge the rim after you get it off. There you go, and that's a nice little rice ball. And then, the way I trim is I get a gift finger, let's make sure this is centered. Yep, it is. Sometimes you hit those little studs that are on the wheel when you put the dipping grip down and uh, it actually uh, isn't flat. So when, be aware of that. When you put these down on the wheel head, make sure the pins aren't touching one of the grooves on the bottom of the dipping grip that make it bounce up and down. There you go. And then you press the pedal down and it takes these in, but if you're not careful, you'll crunch your pot. And then squish it. This one's a little softer, good. Okay, so, oops. How did that happen? It doesn't seem like it. Anyway, there you go. So the Giffen Grip is a speed tool. A lot of people will think these are cheating because it does it for you to center the clay. So I would learn how to center the clay the way I just showed you using the rings and then the, you know you, there are other ways of doing that if you don't have rings on your wheel you can do a permanent marker and draw rings on your wheel head in black so you can see them or you can just tap center like Simon Leach tells you how to do um, and that will actually uh, you know get it into center reasonably quickly so um, but if you're in a production setup and people are shouting at you because their order's late, it's nice to have something that does this fast for you. Seems like whenever anybody wants an order, they want it yesterday. <laughs> and that's understandable because they have a tourist season, especially here, and they want they can only sell things for a few months of the year so they when they want an order they want it but that's why i sort of got out of doing wholesale to galleries i just do a few where the people are really nice okay and then this one's a little easier to do fluting lines on but you just have to be careful that you don't crack your rim when you're doing these even with the lumps of clay, you can crack the rim. So as I said, don't press against the, the rim. You're just pressing on the, the wheel head right next to the rim. And the clay squishes out a little bit and catches the rim. And, uh, and even doing it this way, it's good to have a little damp sponge here that you can just wipe around once like that to actually... Let me show you that a bit better. So you simply hold the sponge and you simply wipe it around like that and then you've got your rim perfectly clean again. So that makes it easy. All right. So those are the um, two basic methods of trimming with lugs of clay or just wetting the rim. Wetting the rim is kind of a, a little bit kind of risky because uh, if the clay's a little bit dry, there is a tendency, I've cracked pieces that way, you've got to be very careful. Um, and also when you release them, you've got to be careful you don't crack the rim because you're putting pressure, you've got to hold it by the foot and push quickly. Uh, but that's how, there, are, there is risk with wetting the rim and doing it that way. The, the simplest and the easiest way is to put your clay down, your pot down on the wheel head with those rings drawn if they're not already there. So you get it centered immediately. And if you draw the rings on the wheel head, you can do them every quarter inch or even every eighth of an inch. So you can get it instantly centered perfectly um, and, uh, you know, and then just trim. Uh, but if not, get yourself a Giffen Grip, that, but they're like three, four hundred dollars, I think, to buy these things. But hey, it saved me, you know, machinery is never cost money. It always saves you money in the end. Um, but anyway, a wheel is essential. Giffen Grip, not really, but you, it's nice to have it. All right, uh, and I'll be glazing these next. Okay, I'm going to do the glazing now, and I've got more than just those little balls to glaze, so I'm not going to put you through all that agony of watching me glaze everything. Uh, but what I do with glazing is I sort things out, so I've got four mugs, four tankards, four little balls, a casserole baking dish, and so on. Just on each shelf there's like that array, so that um, I can put a display out in the gallery showing several things. 
So over here I've got another shelf packed with a whole bunch of things there. Uh, so this will be an all day glazing session um, and it's raining outside so what better thing to do? Okay, so, uh, so I'm going to start doing that and I've got my glazes. Each shelf will be one glaze today dipped on the piece and then tomorrow I come by and do my double and triple dipping on the rims and such to actually do the decorations. Uh, but today it's just a quick base glaze. I pour the glaze in the mugs, the liner glaze, the oatmeal, and then I'll glaze the other one on top of that. And then the bowls I'll just dip with tongs to actually get those glazed. I'll show you that bit. Okay, I mix all my glazes up with a paint stirrer uh, and a drill. So uh, that makes it a lot easier, but it's noisy. That makes it frothy on the surface, so it's a little difficult uh, when you're glazing if you've got like froth bubbles all over your pot for doing second and triple dipping. So I try and scrape the actual froth away during the first few glazing things because it, it, it moves it and you don't get froth on the pots. But then after about five minutes it's all gone anyway and you can stir it slowly with a stick at that point. I also have a clear jug of water and a, a jug of water that's got some darker glazed remnants in there for sponging. So I don't use my dirty water for sponging pieces that uh, are going to be glazed with a nice clean light colored glaze. So, uh, so that's nice to make sure of that. That just keeps your glazing a little cleaner. And then I simply scr scrape the froth away when I'm glazing with a spatula like that over the surface just so the froth is all on one side. Um, and then you can dip fine. So um, let's do this little, I'll do everything on this shelf here, but I'll obviously cut you out for everything else other than the balls, because this is a video about the balls. Well, maybe not. But um, anyway, tongs are the best way to do it. Don't press hard because I throw thin. I mean, these are those half pound, maybe more than half a pound, I can't remember, I should have weighed those balls. Um, but 36 balls from 22 pounds of clay, so that would be more than uh, just, uh, just over half a pound. But anyway, you just dip them in. Count one, two, three, and that's usually plenty of time. Um, if you have some glazes like Randy's Red that needs a thick coated glaze, you, I always count at 10. Um, but, um, and sometimes I'll double dip them too. Um, but, uh, but glazing, there's still a few little bubbles in there from the froth, and, and I won't rub those out, um, because then you cause dust on the glaze, and it's hard to get another glaze to stick. Um, so you don't want to touch them or rub them out. Try to avoid, if you're going to be double dipping anyway, um, try to avoid that. So once again, actually that did, this was the first one I threw in that. Remember that first one I threw in, in this video was really warped when I took it off. That's what it turned out like, you know, because I turned them upside down after they're dry and firm enough a little bit so they dry on the rim uh, and it pretty much flattens and makes them even all over again. But I remember seeing that when I was editing this video that uh, it actually uh, is basically kind of warped when I, when I threw it. But didn't turn out that way. Anyway, scraper, pull the, the bubbles to one side, and then you dip. One, two, three, take it out. I usually just judder it a little bit to stop the glaze from kind of, and that one is much clearer. Very few of those little frothy bubbles and all that, and that won't affect it in any way. It was just if they're big craters that you seem to get an effect. Um, but this is the blue-green copper red glaze, which turns out red in the gas kiln and turquoise in the electric kiln. Everybody loves the turquoise, but the red one's really hard to sell. That uh, copper red is just a, not a popular color, I guess. I have some of the noodle bowls here, same thing. Take a look, make sure there's no froth on the surface, and dip. 
you can scrape the froth away as it's in the water, in the glaze. And then just shake it a little bit. Just don't press hard because the tongue, I've snapped balls. And if you throw thick, you're not gonna have a problem, but, um, but basically I throw fairly thin. When you think about it, if you're throwing 24 mugs from a block of clay, and I usually throw 28 from a 25 pound block of clay, um, and I get pretty decent sized large mugs, 12 to 14 ounces from each mug. Uh, and uh, if you were throwing heavy, you might only get 20 mugs from a block of clay. Um, and therefore I make $150 more from that block of clay um, than you would be if you were only getting the 20. Actually more than that because 20 versus 28 and my mugs are 28. <laughs> anyway, um, here we go. So dip that in. And it's all about economics. I've never done a video based on making a business pay, but I ought to. We're all in this because we love it, but it's nice if you can get paid properly as well. So, um, here we go. So, nice thick coat there of glaze. It dries pretty quickly, usually within a minute. I have to mix up my liner glaze now. My liner glaze is a little thick. I could use a glaze thinner and that would thin it down a little bit. But this glaze has been settling out for a long time. And the water's been evaporating off it, so basically uh, you can just add water. But be careful adding water, you shouldn't add too much water to glazes. You can use glaze thinners, that's sometimes a lot better. But um, anyway, these are big tankers. So it took one and a half yogurt cartons to fill up the inside of that. Now I know that you're all probably knowing this already, but when you pour the glaze on the inside to get your liner glaze, uh, you can then push it down into your outside glaze vertically so that it goes all the way down to the foot where I'm holding it and the air pressure holds the glaze from going on the inside and as long as you lower it down slowly and you pull it out slowly you won't have a blub 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 sound and then the glaze gets inside so um, so that's how you do it and then when it's dry you just flip it over and that's a turquoise one as well. And because all my pieces are bowls and mugs and tankards, that's how I'm going to glaze everything. So I'll see you in about six hours. Okay, I've uh, let these pieces dry all night. Um, and uh, it was a good drying night too, because the rain that was here yesterday all went away. And it was a really breezy night. And now this morning, it's hot. I mean, outside is really hot. So, um, and then it's supposed to cool down next week. So I guess that's to be expected this time of year. Anyway, what it means is I have everything thoroughly dry and I've noted in my glazing that if I glaze something and maybe come back an hour later uh, and glaze another layer on it and while it's still damp, I get a lot more flaking and blistering and things so that um, uh, you get crawling in the firing and stuff like that. So I like to thoroughly let my first layer of glaze dry and then I'll go back and I, know I don't dip a thick layer at this point. Um, because yesterday it was like three seconds, even ten for tomato red and, and uh, Randy's red, uh, ten seconds in a dip. But um, but today it's just a quick dip on each of one or two glazes, uh, just to get a bit of variation in the color, basically. Um, so I've got two glazes open at the moment, and that's my folk art white and uh, my apple green, which I think will look good 
over my oatmeal bowls. So these were the ones that I did yesterday I showed you. And what I do with these two is one dip that I do is by going from one side, then the opposite side, and then the other glaze, that side, and then that side. And it gives me like a square motif. So you go like that, like that. So I end up with that. And then the other direction, a bit harder to see because this glaze is the same color. But I end up with, I'm not sure if you call it a square, it's like an eye. But, um, but anyway, so that gives me like several different shades of colors on that bowl. Um, and it's, so it's oatmeal with apple green and also folk art white over it. So it'll be a light colored bowl. Another way of doing it, if you don't want to have such a geometric looking bowl, is to simply splash. So I've got, a, whoop, I've got an irregular uh, line, and then splash and splash. And that one went over the entire piece. So this, it won't be, it'll be irregular, basically. I can do a swirl. So it gives me a ring around the whole thing, just about. And the same, another swirl. So bit, I've got an irregular swirl going around, so it's not even at all. And these will melt down a little bit, probably in the firing, which I'll show you anyway. So, but that's three different ways of doing the glazing with these bowls to give them a little variation. And then of course I can do slip trailing and whatever else I want to do afterwards, which I'll show you. But I'm going to glaze the rest now. Okay, here's a few of the uh, small bowls as they're coming out of the kiln. I've packed them in three or four different kilns here, so they'll be uh, broken up into different kiln unloadings. But, um, but I just want to concentrate on the bowls. This is the simple one where I glazed the whole thing in basic oatmeal, and then I dipped it in another oatmeal along the side one way, and another apple green across the other way. So you just got this little thin stripe of the original oatmeal there. Uh, this was one where I dipped it all oatmeal and then basically swirled it randomly and then another random over the top of that one and it was basically apple green and the other oatmeal. So I've got all of these ones in here. This is one where I swipe from side to side um, and it's very kind of quiet bowl basically uh, with the apple and the oatmeal again. Um, I did four of each bowl so they'll be spread out. This one, oh, this one did a little crawling in there. That means the glaze was too thick. That's hard when you're actually, you know, just dipping randomly. But um, I can touch that up and refire that one anyway. Uh, this one is my blue green copper red with both of my yellow oatmeals dipped over the top. It's kind of a pretty bowl. Um, it's kind of my beach colors. And we get same again. You've got the eye, is it better which way? That one's an eye, I guess, but um, yellow oatmeal's over a blue, green, copper, red. It's nice on the outside, too. That blue, green, copper, red, of course, will go red in the gas kiln if I reduce. Uh, this is variegated blue, and because of this firing profile where I only soak for 15 minutes at 22, 23, and then bring it down fast, 400 degrees an hour to 2,000, we don't get the running as much. So I solved the running problem. If you look back a year ago, I was having running issues with very heavy blue, which is what this is. And then it had bright blue or, or dark blue with oatmeal over the top to give you all of those kind of crystals in the glaze. Same again, very heavy blue with dark blue and oatmeal. Got lots of crystals in there. It's hard to judge the, if you can see the colors really well. The outside is really pretty again, but look how nicely it runs just to the edge. Um, so this firing profile really is working, saves a lot of pieces running onto the kiln shelf. And finally, some more little bowls. They must all be in the other kiln, which is the next one I'll show in this video. But that's a really pretty little bowl. Bright blue, variegated blue and oatmeal. Oh yes, very nice, yeah. Bright blue, variegated blue, and oatmeal. The variegated blue has a little copper in it, so you can get some green areas coming out. I'm still adjusting my firing schedule, but it looks like I've got a good schedule now, so 
It says that 22.23, I think I was doing before, and I think I'm doing 22.18 now. Um, so it's not that much down, five, six degrees. And then a 15 minute soak, um, and then 400 degrees down to 2000, so we don't get any runs really too, and it's cooling too fast. And then at 175 down from 2000 to 17.50. But it gives you that, beautiful. Okay, this is the other kiln, and this is a little bit warm actually, so I probably won't unpack all this at the moment, but um, but basically these are, well this one is, uh, mouse grey with oatmeal over the top, and that was it, mouse grey and oatmeal. Um, but I think I, think about this, I may have put a little bit of white, just pure white glaze over this as well. but. That's a really nice example of mouse grey with its nice it's crystallized. There's a shadow forming here. Anyway, let's change that. But... Okay, so we've got the mouse grey ones. Oh, that's a hard one to get off. There you go. I put them on stilts even though I wiped the bottom off because I was a bit worried because the mouse grey has been noted for running in the past. But this new firing schedule, I've modified it again. I seem to be doing that all the time. But it's uh, refining it so it doesn't run as much. But this was a nice mouse grey effect. Just oatmeal over the rims. And then there's the creamy folk art white, which is fast becoming a favourite. I won't add the manganese, not manganese, the ilmenite to the mouse, to the folk art white next time um, because those little speckles, I don't think it needs it but um, I'll be mixing glazes again in a week or so that one turned out really nice see how it was running and that's why I stilted them because I was worried that they would get too many runs but that's perfect just enough runs to be really nice Uh, oh, these are the ones I demonstrated in the video. So these are the um, oatmeal with the green. So that's what they look like after the firing. Sort of a random one there. Folk art white again. Very pretty little ball. Nobody has, can, you can never have too many little balls. They're really, really pretty on the outside as well. Looks like an eye again. But, um... If you just tap it, the stilt will often just come right off. That's really pretty. The foot is actually really glossy too. Um, and putting a stilt on means you don't have any nasty sharpness on the actual which I'd have to sand off, but look how beautiful that creamy yellow is on the turquoise. Little balls like this are really popular. Okay, next layer down. Oh, creamy. Put a strawberry in the middle of that one, eh? Very creamy. I hope the color looks good when you're seeing it. It's sort of a warm, buttery cream color with a little hint of that blue turquoise, which was underneath there. But that one I obviously dip really vigorously into the yellow oatmeals. And there's always something that goes, ooh. Every so often I get one of these and I've been playing around with firing schedules to try and, you know, really get it consistent. But it, it's hard, and but this one looks really good. Tenmaku Gold, Flex, perfect. And then you've got the runs with the variegated blue and the oatmeal. And I did a little raspberry drizzle on the inside there. So this is a really good one, but it isn't the best one. This one looks really good. And these were, I thought these were three quarter pound, sorry, I thought they were half pound balls, but I'm beginning to think I made these out of three quarters of a pound of clay um, because I got 36 from a 22 pound bag. I think that's three quarters of a pound, but look how beautiful that is. 
This is just beautiful. Tentacle gold, variegated blue, oatmeal with a raspberry drizzle. Obviously slip trailing rather than drizzle, but, but it's really good. And the runs are so good because they didn't go off the bottom. Anyway, beautiful. I like it when that happens. And here's one I didn't do the variegated blue. I used the oatmeal and the, and the actual uh, raspberry drizzle to see what would... And it's nice, you know, you don't need the variegated blue. Just the oatmeal over the the actual uh, Tenmaku gold. So that's very pretty. Here's another one with the variegated blue. So I did four of all of these. Oh, that one did start to run down. I was lucky I was getting it so perfect. That one I'll have to grind a little bit, but really pretty. So let's keep that one separate. Then I've got variegated blue with bright blue and oatmeal with a raspberry drizzle on that one too. And this is the one that always runs, but it didn't run quite off. So I must have just glazed that one a little thick. What about this one? Nope, not nope, this one either. Oh, I can't get that one off there. there you go. They usually pop off, but sometimes they're tough. Nice little ball. Yeah, that's really pretty too. If I hadn't seen the other ones, I'd be going, ooh, over this one, but this is now blah. But um, anyway, there are some spectacular balls in this firing. Thanks for joining me. Um, I'm still trying to do a video a week. Um, but it's getting busier, so it's going to be a push. So just stay safe, enjoy your summer, um, get out in the sun, and uh, be careful. All right, take care. Bye.